In there. Are we ready, Lori? Ready. Yes. Ready? Okay. Uh, call to order, uh, Common Council meeting in the City of Brookings. It's Monday, July, uh, it's Monday, March 13th, 2023, and it's 7 p.m. Please rise with me for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lori, please take the roll when you're ready. Councillor Hodges? Here. Councillor Shriver? Here. Councillor Martin? Here. Councillor Morosky? Here. Mayor Hedenskog? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, item D, appointments and announcements. Um, item number one is reappoint Skip Hunter to the Planning Commission. This will be his second tour, I believe. Uh, motion to uh, reappoint Skip Hunter to the Planning Commission position number one to expire April 1st, 2027. Second. Please call the question. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Morosky? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Hodges? Yes. Mayor Hedenskog? Yes. May motion carries. Item number two, accept the resignation of Zeus Samora for Parks and Recs Commission. Uh, motion to accept Zeus Samora's resignation from Parks and Rec Commission, position number two, term expiring February 2025. Second. Call the question when you're ready. Councillor Morosky? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Hodges? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Mayor Hedenstab? Yes. Motion carries. And item three, appoint Ryan Renew to Parks and Recs Commission. And I'll move to appoint Ryan Renault to the Parks and Recs Commission, position two, expiring February 1st, 2025. Second. And the question, please. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Hodges? Yes. Councillor Martin? Yes. Councillor Morosky? Yes. Mayor Hedenskog? Yes. Motion carries. Oral requests and communications from the audience. I'll take them just the way I have them in order. John McKinney, please. Any speakers, please state your name and address, and you'll have five minutes. Is this, is this off? No, it's on. I don't see a light. Thank you. John McKinney, 42 Floral Drive, Brookings, Oregon. <clears throat> I'm here to uh, talk about an investigation done by the Curry County Sheriff's Office uh, when they received a call from Gary Milliman on October 27th, 2022, when Gary was our pro tem uh, city manager. And what Gary had discovered that day was in a locked file cabinet in General Howard's office was a grocery bag full of prescription narcotics, most of them being painkillers. <clears throat> Ms. Howard was uh, was interviewed by the uh, Curry County deputies in reference to uh, this discovery and her reasoning for having a grocery bag full of prescription drugs <clears throat> was that uh, the, the narcotics were from her uh, her kids from surgeries and and uh, injuries and that she would take prescription drugs out of her house um, because there were so many uh, kids and friends that came in and out of the house and she would put them in her, in her office <clears throat> under lock and key, which sounds like a reasonable explanation, except for the fact that Ms. Howard um, 
being the city manager, is in charge of the police department and knows that we have a program to get rid of prescription drugs in a lawful manner, not by taking them from the house, hiding them in your office under lock and key. <clears throat> we have a destruction device in the police department that citizens regularly dispose of their expired medication. All she had to do was walk 50 feet down the hallway and get rid of them, like all of us are expected to do. If anyone would like a copy of this investigation, I have it. I can email it to you, and it just shows further behavior by the highest paid city employee of Brookings that thinks that she can do whatever she wants to do. James 98748 East Community Drive, Harbor. In lieu of your latest resignation of Jesus Zamora, who just, you just reappointed, reappointed him January 9th, again, because of your bias protection and rehiring of our, your city manager. Another example of no confidence on your continued decisions. Let me bring to your constituents back to your secret closed executive sessions of January 10th, 16th, and 19th on this same city manager. At least one of those closed sessions, this, your city attorney advised you and your council not to rehire her. Before the public vote, you also had the results of your secret Ferreras report investigation on your city manager. The same report, which may or may not have been disclosed to the city, to the district attorney during the now closed court case of your city manager. Who, by the way, John already demonstrated she perjured herself and lied about having no other theft histories. That's on Fred Meyer's records. What are the findings of this Ferraris report that you're hiding from us? More worse, worse issues. The rehire vote, the two counselors who originally voted no are no longer part of this council. But the four yes votes fall back on you. You position the mayor, position number two, three, and four. Number one is the only one that voted no. And I remind you that counselor number three has a past performance record, former board member of Harbor, who's given the choice of resign or be recalled. And Mark, I'm gonna stop you right there because this has got nothing to do with what you're talking. And naming out particular people on this board. I didn't name, I said right. numbers. Just continue on. But All right, out. thank you. If number four, the four of you don't resign as a consequence of your behavior, in the city manager fiasco. There are options for the opposing constituents here, such as continually packing this room every two weeks, staring you all down. They can do sidewalk protests, go to national media outlets, not just local ones, and sign letters of no confidence on all of you and put it on record here. And then once your term hits six months, there's a process that can be started on your recalls. Eventually, you're going to fall on your own swords. As to your recent city manager contract, I pointed out in January that purposely omitted the misdemeanor clause <clears throat> for termination. And that if you fired her, she would get a certain large amount of monetary. But if she resigns on her own, that voids that. Well, who in their right mind is going to resign on their own and void their, 
big money. January 24th, I put in, under the Public Information Act, PIA, for this Ferraris report investigation, and was quickly denied by your employer filling in for deputy city recorder. I was denied under the premise of ORS, Oregon Revised Statute 192.502, parentheses 9, saying it was attorney-client privilege records. We'll get to that, that in a minute. I went on the ORS state page and found no specific statute. The statute goes from ORS 192.499 to ORS 192.508. I screenshot that and shot it to email it to your acting employee. This Ferraris investigation file isn't attorney-client privileges. Your city manager was never the client here. The client was you guys the, and the council who hired this investigator. And that makes the city taxpayers the client. Their taxes paid for this report. They're the clients. They have a right to see this report. <laughs> Besides, the court case is closed now. All you need to do is redact the city's manager's address and birth date and give us the findings. And I'll end with this. Bugs on a car grill either fall off or they get scrubbed and washed off. Bishop. Can I get one of these to each counselor, please? City Councilors, my name is Rick Bishop. I live at 625 Spruce Street, Apartment A, right in the middle of downtown Brookings. Been a resident there most of my life since I've been 10 years old. I've lived in this town. I've worked in this town since I've been 12. Uh, I just got put on Social Security Disability a few years ago. Um, still own a Mazda dealer in the downtown corridor. And um, I've been having a lot of problems with the downtown area getting things done. I've got emails in that deal from you guys back to 2011, trying to get a sidewalk fixed on Hemlock Street. It's kind of neat, I found my old computer and I got some emails on this stuff to show you guys just how I've been treated in that downtown area. Next uh, couple weeks, I won't be here, I'll have to be down in Vegas with the kids partying, but uh, I'll bring in a whole box of stuff that I've got from the downtown committees, a proud study. A master plan where this money from urban renewal was uh, voted in to be spent on and uh, you see pictures of kind of the drainage still even after they came down and fixed it a week ago that's some of the last pictures but on December 3rd 2015 there's a storm that brought down a sign off the wall of Central Building that simply damaged the four Mazda vehicles. Uh, Mr. Gossett's uh, denied the claim. I probably a lawsuit against him. The judge uh, ruled in my favor. Of course, there'd been a handshake agreement on that lot for uh, 45 plus years. But when the uh, lease came due, Mr. Gossett, Mr. Curtis, Mr. Millen, they had a plan to hurt my business and make them all city monies, leading uh, partiality and enforcement. So now the city of Brookings leases an unneeded parking lot for Mr. Curtis. Mr. Curtis already has free city parking in front of said vehicle. But thank you, I, I appreciate the free use of the parking lot myself. I use it quite often and so do my customers and employees. Uh, there were emails, and I don't understand why the taxpayers are having to pay for it, but you know, if that's what you guys wish, right on. 
Uh, there was emails to the city manager about what he was doing to my business, but it was all about the money. So follow the money at the same time Mr. Milliman made a statement. There was an end of the uh, lot uh, for sale at the end of the street. It was a firm street lot. In April 2017, I closed on that 315 Firm Street, proceeding to making it into a sales lot, in which I did. And um, next came an abatement notice. Can't sell cars off the lot I bought, as the city manager told me, you know, buy the lot so you got a place to sell more cars. And uh, couldn't do it. He sent me an abatement notice, so I could change it over. Let's see, so what did we do? We, so went to a meeting and then proceeded to get plants to make it into a sales lot. After the fourth trip to the city, the engineer that plant, the, made the plans made the statement, good luck with them at City Hall, they don't like you. At that okay. point then my wife said, why are we trying to spend money to dress up this town? And at that time we were already having a good time down in Arizona and playing around down there, so I understood what she was talking about because we are just, uh, I spent like five grand with an engineer and got nowhere back and forth, back and forth. In fact, the city never did send me a refund. I found out on that money just lately as I'm going back through computers and paperwork. Uh, so uh, I was told I didn't bring the lot up to code for automotive sales. All I'd be able to do is use my lot for storage um, and storage of vehicles. I couldn't, I couldn't have any sales signs in my vehicles. I am using a lot for storage as I was told I could on a letter in July 7th, 2021, stating that you would accept the verbal agreement for use of storage even though it does not comply. It's amazing somebody can do that, one person, but I guess it can be done in Brookings. Now five years later, because of a pissing match with my neighbor, you're going to tell me I can't use my property for storage? You're baiting my truck and trailer parked on my own property? This is harassment. Why did Public Works start evading vehicles parked on owner's property? Shame on you. Uh, this is now a legal matter, as you can see. Uh, if the city would have used the urban renewal monies it's voted for, not for Azalea Park, not for Railroad Street, but the downtown master plan, which I don't know if any of you guys have even opened the book and looked at it. But I know you put money in the Azalea parking lot and the master plan, it has Azalea Park in it, but. It's, it's in the urban renewal, but it's not in the master plan. It was for later later projects. It wasn't there to kill the money like you guys did. Um, but for the downtown master plan, all these problems would have been solved and our downtown area cleaned up. This is what we people expect our tax money to go for and vote on. As you can see reading Pat Dodgen's letter, there's been a drainage problem for many years before I owned such property as stated, but the city continued to state no money was available. Bullshit. The monies have been moved around, not spent works planned by urban renewal and downtown committees. City taxpayers voted for them, same as a gas tax used on city insurance. But in September when it was brought up, it was only answered by city manager Janelle. It was legal. We want ethics. If I don't get grandfathered in, as I've heard you say to all others, it's time to say we disagree and let the courts handle it. I'm using my lot for storage as agreed years ago until I develop after the city does their drainage. I figure I've lost a couple million in gross sales, if not more, by this harassment. And yes, Brookings Auto Sales is a gravel lot. And yes, my, Stru my Spruce Street lot that is paid was a dirt sales lot for 30 plus years. And yes, there is storage containers in the same C3 block on a vacant lot. And yes, more storage containers in downtown core and lots that do not comply. And right away, this is unconscionable your election of duty. We should be ashamed of yourselves. Yeah, I'm sure I am. As you can see, there are plenty of storage containers in the neighborhood has been for years, including multiples in the library and fret buyers parking lot. You said I could store vehicles, but mine gets abated as does anything whenever somebody snitches on another. Is that the way zoning is supposed to work? One man who can change his mind on whatever, depending on whatever day and weather, please make this stop, do your job fairly, or resign. That's all I want, equal. It shouldn't matter the past, so stop. From here out, I will use my lock for anything legal, which includes sales. I have six developed properties that downtown area and I take damn good care of and I will use my property as I feel. Thank you. Please stop for that. Please stop for that. Well, I'm done for that. Stop. Now. Get him to stop. I'm serious. I'm done. This could get fun.
party will continue. <coughs> Victor Ortega. Victor Ortega, 96511 West Drive. I'm here to speak in opposition to the rehiring of Janelle Howard as city manager. Contrary to what the mayor believes and stated, I do not believe that the majority of residents, as you can see behind me, or the city staff agree. So why has there been several resignations recently if that was so? There would be more if they didn't depend on the jobs as a living and, you know, as to make a wage for a living and to be living here in Brookings, which is where, you know, they want to live. Everyone deserves a second chance. Uh, I believe Ms. Howard had hers and she wasted it. We all know what happened up in Coos Bay, so that's why I say that. With this, uh, you know, rehiring, <coughs> I, I believe the <coughs> council with this decision is not a credit to the city of Brookings. Thank you. Sherman. Yeah, I'm Dan Sherman. I'm uh, 835 Brookhaven Drive, Brookings, 97415. It's all been said. I don't really need to say it. I just want it on record. It has been said by this council that the people that you have talked to have expressed approval for the rehiring of the city manager. I live on a different planet because that's not what I hear. What I hear is a lot of opposition to that. And that makes me sad. I just want it on record. I'm opposed to it. I believe the city council is wrong. Well, at least four fifths of it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you much. Yeah. This is Shampoo. 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 I'll clarify that. Susan Shampo, I live at 208 Musser Street. My remarks tonight are in regards to your decision to reinstate Janelle Howard as the city manager. Frankly, I'd rather be sitting in a dentist chair than standing here right now. But that's how strongly I feel about this. I won't bore you with what I think, because city leadership has shown me repeatedly over the years that what a growing minority of us think doesn't matter. You've also hired experts to evaluate and make recommendations about a number of issues I've been aware of and also ignore them. So instead of telling you what I think, I'll just pose some rhetorical questions for you to ponder. First, how do you feel when you hear this city, my city, our city, mentioned on nightly news out of Medford and they're not talking about the weather? I'm repeatedly mortified. Aren't you? Do you really think the majority in Brookings support your squandering of our tax dollars on lawsuit expenses and payouts and costly research that you consistently disregard? How do you justify rewarding someone who's committed fireable offenses with seven months paid leave followed by a reinstatement and a raise? It appears you're afraid you'll be sued despite the overwhelming evidence in the $8,000 Ferraris report, not to mention Fred Meyer's videos. Have you considered that you may be doing Ms. Howard a disservice by not requiring some sort of assistance with what appears to be her recurring problem? How many police and other critical city employees will resign before you realize you have a big issue that's not going away? I can't resign from Brookings. I could leave, but it's been my home for over 15 years. 
and despite the crazy things that go on, my life and my friends are here now, and I don't want you to take them away from me. Everyone I've talked to, conservative and progressive alike, wonder what she must have on you. <laughs> <laughs> our descending counselors, thank you. I support the Parks and Rec Commissioner who resigned. I support the police officer who resigned from his job and his paycheck. And I support everyone who speaks out about your questionable decision to reinstate an unrepentant shoplifter as our city's CEO. As this list grows, I can't help but wonder myself, what she got on you? Okay, I think transparency and facts are really important. And I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. As has been mentioned here, the statement that you were elected and the people must agree, especially with the mayor's position, because he was public about it. Well, I also ran in the last election for city council. And here's the facts. The mayor received 1,259 votes. I received 1,113 votes. He received 146 more votes than I did. Our percentages were 47.03 and 45.3. They were different races, but still the same people voting. So I don't see the vote in November as a mandate or approval of anyone's position. The public obviously is very divided on this matter, and the mayor and the counselors are responsible to all the citizens of Brookings. Now I'm gonna be a numbers geek on you. One cost, back, cost aspect of this situation that has never been publicly discussed is the amount of the legal costs to the city. Mm -hmm. These costs are included in the city council's agenda as monthly vouchers, but you have to search for each payment and most people don't know how to find this information. I reviewed the last four months and the following amounts were spent on legal fees according to the monthly voucher reports. November 13,948, December 5,011, January 12,466, February 12,622, for a total of $44,047. Not all of this is related to this situation, but I'm sure that a lot of it is. Full transparency needs to start now. The lack of transparency so far is not acceptable. One place to start is following the money. The public deserves to know the total costs the city has incurred since July of 2022 regarding this matter. Legal costs, investigations, additional staffing for seven months, increased insurance rates if applicable, and any other cost. I am requesting that a full financial impact report by the council be made public as soon as possible. There are other actions I hope the council will consider in addressing the public concerns, but let's start with the actual amount of tax dollars our council has voted to spend regarding this matter. Thank you. Connie Hunter. Connie? Yeah, Always at the back of the class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Connie Hunter. I live at 1310 English Court, Brookings, Oregon. And I wanted to thank you you for being brave enough to reappoint Skip Hunter for the Planning Commission. And so I appreciate that. But I wanted to talk more importantly about the staff reports 
uh, with regards to the USDA uh, rural development loan resolutions. I have to take a deep breath because I can't believe it's actually happening. This represents nearly 10 years of positioning the opportunity to build this necessary infrastructure for homes that are affordable. We're looking at affordable workforce housing in the big picture. In the short term, we have to take steps like are being done uh, now to find that level of funding to build the things that need to be built. <clears throat> the state of Oregon is preparing to fund $27 million to 26 rural counties. Recently, the governor <clears throat> had an executive order specific to affordable housing. <clears throat> he spe she specifically mentioned Southern Oregon and Southern Oregon Coast. We can be very pleased for the advocacy that's come from our neck of the woods and the connections that the city of Brookings has made with our housing authority. Two years back, we didn't have those kinds of relationships. When I am able to hear the new executive director of the Coos Prairie Housing Authority report something very profound, that there is a pathway to having our <clears throat> housing authority actually own units of affordable housing in Curry County, that's a huge milestone. <clears throat> the city of Brookings has set the example along the way. First off, they provided $35,000 towards the first housing assessment that took place in Curry County. Secondly, our mayor, Ron Hedenskog, was very frank with our regional solutions team coordinator who represents the office of the governor a few years ago when the cities under $10,000 were not in the mix for the fix for housing solutions. That has changed and I, ha I have not seen the advocacy come as strong from anywhere in the state of Oregon for that effort than right here in Curry County. So we have lots of things to do, lots of things to grow, but we're headed in the right direction and I am grateful for the hard work of all the staff, including Janelle Howard and including our public works folks and including this council who made it that policy <coughs> step forward to admit that we needed affordable workforce housing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move into staff reports and, and make a few decisions here regarding business. Uh, if you'd like to leave, I'll rest for a minute here and let you walk out, or we'll start business. Okay. Um, item G, staff reports and hearings. First off, we have um, Chetco Avenue enhancements, working with ODOT. Are we going thank, to thank you, Mayor Hedenskog, members of the council. Um, over the past several decades, uh, staff has received complaints regarding pedestrian safety, vehicle speed, and lack of safe parking on Chetco Avenue in the downtown core. Uh, action items resulting from community design committees, downtown master plan, and strategic planning discussions indicated a need for uh, some kind of relief for the downtown core portion of Chetco Avenue, which is um, Oak to uh, Pacific. Action items and past performance projects include enhancing enhanced pedestrian crossings uh, at the Redwood Theater, uh, future pedestrian crossing enhanced enhancements on Checo Avenue uh, include improvements of Pacific Avenue and Fifth, which are uh, fall under the SRTS grant program that we received in 2023-2024. Uh, uh, that, that's when that project is slated, as well as uh, Arnold, Rans Arnold and Ransom as part of the ODOT sidewalk project for Lucky Lane. So those are crossing enhancements that you'll see in the future. Um, 
but uh, Pacific, Arnold, and uh, Railroads or uh, Ransom. Uh, enhanced safety for on-street parking, development of additional on-street parking along side streets like Mill, Center, Wharf, Fern, Willow, and Oak. We've seen in past projects downtown uh, starting in 2006. Um, a lot of urban renewal money was spent uh, to, to develop those streets uh, with curb gutter and sidewalk and parking. Uh, this provides options in lieu of parking on Checo Avenue. Um, enhanced visibility between vehicular and pedestrian interactions, uh, i.e. crosswalks, uh, offloading for parallel parking uh, is another big, big issue that needs to be addressed. General walkability of downtown core, encouraging visitors driving through to stop and shop in the downtown core, uh, off-street parking uh, like Fleet Street, addition of the Checo, uh, or the central building parking lot, potential lots, uh, the downtown core to be determined. Um, could assist also in that uh, on-street parking relief. Um, the staff, when we did uh, Railroad Street, you may recall we were anticipating that traffic patterns would change, that uh, our locals would use Railroad Street um, as sort of a bypass to Chetco Avenue in those busy, busy months when we have, you know, almost 20,000 vehicles uh, passing through our city. Um, what we what we asked ODOT to um, do an analysis of traffic count on both Chetco Avenue and Railroad Street once Railroad Street was completed. And what they determined um, is that both streets increased in traffic. It didn't necessarily go down. So our, our hope was that Railroad Street would relieve Chetco Avenue enough to where we could consider potentially reducing the lanes in the downtown core area down to three one in each direction with the turn lane. Uh, you may recall that the, most, of our, most of our problems in our downtown, when we did this, when we went through the speed, um, the reduction in speed analysis that ODOT provided, uh, much of the traffic incidences were uh, left-hand turns. So uh, adding a left turn, turn lane uh, in that downtown core area would be a really, really strong uh, approach at reducing some of those issues. So. In the staff report, you see um, an analysis that was provided by um, ODOT when we requested the option of potentially looking at the um, at the uh, three-lane reduction, which it's called a road diet, for lack of, uh, lack of better terms, but it's also identified uh, in, in the uh, guidance for um, uh, cross-section uh, traffic volumes. Um, there, uh, ODOT has identified some uh, key issues that they find um, with the three-lane reduction that they're, they're recommending not doing a three-lane um, reduction. What, what they are <clears throat> offering is to um, look at other options. So I prepared two motions. Um, the motions are to potentially look at um, some other changes that we could look at downtown if we're not look if we don't want to have ODOT pursue the three lane, um, that would be to one option would be to um, eliminate all on street parking between Oak and Pacific Avenue, uh, eliminate on street parking in various locations uh, within that stretch of road, um, and maybe pr particularly in the locations where we'd want to try and develop a, a mid-center turn lane. Um, those could be at, at Oak, um, at Center, and um, maybe Pacific, if it's possible, if, the right -away, if there's enough right-of-way there. Uh, eliminate all left turns except at Oak Street and Center Street where traffic signaling will offer safe left turns uh, to, and develop a center turn lane at these intersections. Uh, enhance pedestrian crossings at Fern Avenue, Willow Street, and Mill Street, and Highland Avenue intersections. Those three are not necessarily highlighted like some of the others are at, at the Redwood Theater, at where we'll have it at Pacific, um, and Arnold. So those, those could be um, some options we could have uh, ODOT develop a scope of work, and that scope of work we would then take to a traffic uh, engineer and have them do an analysis of that, uh, th those options to see what would work best in our downtown, and of course balancing with um, our stakeholders down there. We'd, there would there would be a, obviously there'd be 
some kind of interaction with the, the business owners and the stakeholders in our downtown to, to develop a plan that would work for everyone. So with that, if you have any questions. Yeah, Tony, I recall when we had a discussion with ODOT that they said one reason why they're not recommending the, the road diet to th take it down to three lanes is because that somewhere around above 2,000 vehicles 20,000 20, excuse me 20,000 vehicles uh, it becomes unsafe and uh, and I'm going to note on the page the next page over from your staff report that we already have 21,000 vehicles crossing the bridge the Chetco bridge but if you look and see at the next intersection which is they call it east of Alder that would be Constitution Way we've already lost over over a thousand vehicles at Constitution Way so I'm suspecting that those are vehicles carrying kids to school on normal school days and they're turning off the Constitution to go up to up to the up the campus uh, but anyway but just continue to look there the numbers just continue to decrease as you go on northbound up Chetco Avenue so uh. yeah so between between Alder and Fern you have almost 20,000 vehicles peak now and that's now that's not that's not the projected growth which they have a percentage that they project yeah, yeah. so you know in in five years those numbers could easily be over 20 20 exactly. 25,000 even thank you that's where I was heading with that um, I'm wondering uh, if the traffic will continue to move down onto Railroad Street, continue to move down there uh, over the next couple of years now that Railroad Street's completed. No more delays there. So I've, I've prepared two motions. We, you know, obviously we're, we're getting strong opposition from ODOT to to consider the road diet mm -hmm. uh, and maybe lean more towards uh, enhancements that that could be evaluated uh, that wouldn't change that wouldn't reduce it down um, you know okay well I'm gonna open it up for questions or deliberations if you want to discuss to the council Tony as you have this laid out um, to you know a isn't really what I was hoping for but B definitely would be along those lines where in those specific areas where we need to widen to put that center turn lane in that's that's what B is really talking about getting that yeah. street parking off there so I I'm 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 like the, I, I'm with that and the and the pedestrian crossings being illuminated I I really you know I would think that's the best solution personally uh, I hear what you say. Uh, the pedestrians are the major concern to me, uh, especially when it's dark out there and, and the, the crossings um, that aren't lit. It's pretty dicey, especially when you got four lanes of traffic going and somebody's stopping and somebody thinks, well, maybe they had a flat tire and speeds right through that crosswalk without thinking. And uh, I'm surprised we haven't had more problems with that. On the other hand, I. I think we might differ because I, I really don't want to eliminate any street parking, so I'm, I'm hesitant to do that for the downtown. I think um, certain people really value that street parking, and it's hard to make that climb up some of those hills. And if we change the the, the lighting on the pedestrian crossings, um, maybe more people will use the lot across the street. But that's that's kind of my opinion on that. Can I ask for a clarification from Tony? Are, um, I'm making an assumption, and maybe I'm wrong, so I want to clarify. But you're asking us either to um, recommend number one or recommend number two, which would include A through D. We, do we need to? We don't need to choose um, two C specifically. Will they do? A, will they do an evaluation that includes? A through D as all as options and come up with what they think is best or do we need to narrow it down to which one of those sub letters you can narrow it down you don't have to pick if, if, if you were can all agree in consensus you don't want a then we can eliminate that in your motion 
But it just, doesn't have to be just one. Doesn't have like to be they, just one. They could evaluate what's it like to remove all parking yeah. and what's it like to leave some parking where we can right. and we can then compare those. We don't have to pick just one direction. They can give us a few options. Right. Okay. Well, I, I favor the um, analysis of leaving the street parking by the theater for those businesses on that block either way, but the turn lane by Oak Street, which would eliminate the um, you know, one block of, of traffic uh, north of there, it's already eliminated to the south, but um, really looking at uh, adding that turn lane and then seeing how that's going to impact the traffic flow where the, treat, where the street parking continues uh, in the, um, the, the, the the core area near the theater, but I I, I think the um, a priority of that one additional turn lane. I think if we add any more turn lanes, then that basically eliminates all of the parking in the downtown area, or on on 101. Well, I would say I think that we should go with some version of two because ODOT's telling us one's not really, it's not truly an option that they can support. So I think we need to go with some version of two. Um, I definitely want the crosswalk pedestrian crossings to be enhanced. Um, D, I would like to see us maintain as much of the on-street parking as we can for the businesses there. Um, and then maybe some com combination of the left turn lanes, wherever ODOT's recommendation is to keep it safe. I mean, I just think it's, it comes down to what, what they recommend that's going to be the safest, balanced with keeping some parking if we can. Okay. I think we've all got in an agreement. Uh, the motion's not going to be number one, it's going to be number two. And, uh, and I'm hearing very clearly that we want to, we want to, uh, engineer some left turns in those areas but not eliminate any more parking that's necessary and uh, and the pedestrian enhancements Tony I think so it's it's a it's a wash for a B C and D might I add um, it, it, we all drive through town and we know where the parking happens but if you drive through town you also notice that there's a lot of parking that doesn't happen um, in areas that it can something to consider if, if we if we go through a traffic analysis and look at some of those those areas that are not being used as as on street parking it, as an option to could possibly consider adjusting the lane so that we could offer up that that center lane it's something I would leave on the table at least um, eliminating some downtown parking if it's feasible I think the stakeholders will come out and tell you where they don't want parking to be eliminated. And so I think the idea of, of creating a turn lanes at certain intersections will flesh out once you get that feedback from, from your core of business owners. I just let that play out in the process. So you may want to keep, you may want to keep um, um, B, you know, evaluate some off street park, some on street parking Agreed. removal in order to accommodate that left turn. Well, it, it, ODOT's not going to come back with the thing chiseled in granite right off the start. Right. They're going to come back with well, options they're, and they're yeah. going to develop the scope. A scope. And yes. then we have to pr provide that scope to a uh, traffic engineer, which, you know, we've been told could range anywhere between 10 and 20,000 to have that analysis done. Okay. But we don't know the scope yet, so we don't know exactly where it's going to land. All right. Do we want a motion? So or? It sounds like B, C, and D. Yes. yes. Well, I'm, does does anybody want to eliminate all left turns? We I would consider leaving it on the table just to look at which ones we can safely, and which ones we can't. I think if we can develop a left turn lane at some of these intersections, then we don't want to eliminate the left turn there. But where we can't develop a safe left turn lane you might consider it given that those left turns are typically where our traffic accidents happen that's been sh that's been proven mm -hmm. so when that left turning uh, motion happens a lot of times there's hasty decisions that turn into fender benders so we just again like leave it open knowing that you know the stakeholder are going to make that decision ultimately when we do this analysis you want it, you want a motion tonight or do you just want a consensus i need direction so okay. if you want to uh, go to and 
and sure. pick B, C, D, then we Mich can move move in that direction. Michelle, I think you're ready to. You already said it. You want to you want to make a motion? Or? Do I need to read this whole thing? No, no, no. Just read. <laughs> Just read what. <laughs> uh, I I move that the city uh, that the city requests the Oregon Department of Transportation complete an analysis of the following street enhancements along Checo Avenue between Oak Street and Pacific Avenue to include option B, C, and D. I'll second that. Okay. Please call the question. Councilor Martin. Yes. Councilor Moroski. Yes. Councilor Schreiber. Yes. Councilor Hodges. Yes. Mayor Hinsbach. Yes. <clears throat> Staff reports number two is the USD, a, USDA RD loan resolutions. And Janelle, I uh, looked at this again this afternoon, and it appears to me that the council makes one resolution motion, and then that authorizes you to sign the three documents. Correct. So the city resolution number is 1236, and then there's just three separate USDA. Um, loan resolutions because they don't do anything over ten million dollars, so all three are under ten. But it's for that total twenty four nine ninety six. Okay, but that didn't answer my question quite. Just the one resolution. We that's just stated we in vote the on the one resolution, and then that authorizes you to to sign the others. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. So uh, page twenty. You want to you want to add any more than that? Just the recommended motion. That's all. You, well, you want me to start from now? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you, you're interrupting the middle. <laughs> um, so kind of going back to actually probably about 2014, but the, um, we started this process and the application process for USDA RD. Um, in 2016, we completed the wastewater facility plan, which um, sort of listed out where our weaknesses were in our sewer system and started developing the uh, capital improvement plan for the USDA loan. Um, that loan was at a low interest rate, of course, has changed many times since 2014. At the time that we locked it in last year in 2022, it was 2.0, still really low compared to where the market is now. Um, in between there, we had an additional preliminary engineer report and environmental report, both of which we had to contract out Dyer to provide lots of hurdles over the almost nine years now. Um, to accomplish. So we did lock it in in um, March of last year, I believe, April of last year. And um, now it's just, again, additional checklist items. Um, and this is one on USDA's checklist is for us to pass this resolution saying that you guys are understanding it. When we um, finalize it, when we're ready to close on each of those loans after um, we start construction, and um, have interim financing up to that point, and then we would long-term finance like the nine million or the 8.996 million, um, then the long-term funding will pay off the interim financing. And when that happens, there's the third page of each of those resolutions is saying, okay, the council hasn't changed their mind since <laughs> the last time we approved it. So that's it's more of just a specific um, requirement that USDA has. Ours typically would look more like our city resolution, but they have this form that we have to sign. Well, are you ready for a history report? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's a long one. In, I think it was 2004, we borrowed up to $13,000 to rebuild the uh, wastewater treatment plant. It, uh, it was suffering overflows. 13 million. 13 million, not 13,000. Did I say 13,000? Yes, actually, it was 13 million. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I came on to the council shortly after that, and it was scary because the payment was about a million dollars a year. For we paid it off last spring. June, yes, June 22. Last, last June we paid it off, and uh, everybody that voted yes for that loan, well, we didn't really have, the city didn't have much choice. They were getting ready to put a moratorium on building because our sewer plant just couldn't handle it anymore. So it was a necessity, but it was a scary one to go $13 million in debt for that long a period of time. And uh, they felt that the growth in the city would pay for it. They had rated at about a 3% growth a year. 3% growth never happened. And about 
2007, 2008, somewhere in there, we realized we weren't making enough payments. It was taking too much out of general fund to make that million dollar payment. And so we had to raise all the rates, all the sewer rates, water rates, in order to be able to make those payments. And that's what we've been doing up until June of last spring. So the scary part to me is, and I'm gonna express it, it is scary, is that we were not only afraid at $13 million back in 2004, 2005, but now we're talking about going $25 million plus to uh, finish up and fix up all the rest of our infrastructure underground, doing some work to the plant. And uh, this, is, this is no real small task we're taking on. Uh, the amount of work this is going to be involved is going to, I believe, literally swamp our staff. They're going to be very busy just taking care of this loan and all the construction that's going to go along with it. However, as Connie Hunter mentioned, this is what is necessary because, first of all, we have lots of infrastructure that is that is not up to snuff. Uh, we've got lots of leakage, water leakage that needs to be fixed. And then, of course, in order to enhance, bring on any new growth, we're gonna have to have that sewer plant up to full speed. So I don't see much of a choice. We're gonna have to take the, take the bullet. And I'll open it up for discussion or questions. Janelle, can you fill me in on what the next step is after like the process of implementing? Sure. Um, Tony and I have been working a lot with USDA and DEQ on the, the projects and just never-ending checklists that they have. There's always one more thing to do. Um, right. Just this last week, um, Tony finalized some work with our engineers on the specific federal contracts that are required and they're required to be listed and put in a time frame different than every other large construction project we do. So Dyer just finalized that and is getting approval from USDA next. Um, the, the next step once, and there probably will be a couple more back and forth, just my guess between USDA and the engineer. There's two engineers working on this, one engineer for the collection system, which is Dyer, our regular engineer that we've used, that's been our engineer of record for a decade or more. And then the other engineer is actually Jacobs, um, who is working on the treatment plant engineering for the treatment plant, et cetera. So um, in, let's just say within a couple weeks of that, then we would be, the engineers would be going forward with the detailed engineering. There's been preliminary engineering done early so that we could get the cost estimates to even come up with the loan documents. Um, and then there's, um, it's, it's basically outlined between now and 2026, the construction period. Um, two high priorities um, as soon as the engineering um, is completed would be to complete the infrastructure north of town. And then there's um, the, the Mill Street, uh, excuse me, the Mill Beach um, down so that we can eliminate that pump station, which is where we've had issues before. Um, all within the next two and a half years, but those would be the two that we're, we'd be pushing quickly. Um, did I leave anything out on the timing? Was that? So in that then, um, I know that this is highly specialized work, and I'm not gonna be ignorant of that, but you know, I've brought this up before. When we do bidding, you know, there, there will be competitive bidding to come in to whatever these projects, I mean, they'll be opened up for that, correct? We're not, correct. we're making sure that it's it's very transparent and, and we see what the bids are coming in at. We, we pick the proper construction company or whoever to do the work in, um, in a way that uh, makes it, you know, makes not just us, but the public comfortable in the fact that it's being wisely used. Yes, so on, on a construction project, um, over so this is easily over that amount but any construction project that we have that's over 250,000 automatically gets um, published in the daily journal journal of commerce which is it's it's out of portland or the, at least the branch we use is out of portland but it, it it catches 
construction firms from all over the place. Typically speaking, even though we do publish in that, we really do get our two, two local bidders on almost all of those projects. However, this one is big enough that it might get some attention from outside the area to be competitive. So for sure, that there's no way that USDA would let us, they'll, they'll make us double <laughs> the no, I appreciate you clarifying that. Yeah, That's no great. Problem. Thank you. So uh, as I understand it, though, this will cover us basically all the improvements that need to be made on the north side of town. That's the area around Arnold and, um, and Hub Street and Iris and Rowland and all that area, right? So that's all going to be up to snuff. And extend us all the way out to the college. It'll complete the extension out there. Right. Some, of that, some of that infrastructure is in place. Uh, right. We're inf infilling what's missing. Right. And station and force main. And when that large annexed property up there north of town actually gets built out, which seems, in the information I've received, is not as far away as it has been, um, then the fees, as we get the water fees and everything, that'll subsidize us this money back. Right, because they'll be paying for uh, for all the the new the new residents out there. We'll be paying we'll for be paying, the yeah. We'll be paying for all the, the SDCs. wastewater. Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. So, so it's just a matter of we got to build it, and they will come. Right. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And in our match, out of the there's a twenty approximately I'm rounding up a twenty five million dollar loan. There's a two point five million dollar grant, right. and there's about two point six that's our matching funds, which are coming from our SRF and our SDC funds that you have saved up over. So that will help replenish them as those houses are built. Right. Yep. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing that. I think what Mrs. Hunter said earlier about you know getting affordable housing and more housing in the area is really critical. So I'm looking forward to that. Current building permit on a standard residence is about it's over twenty thousand dollars in STCs. Just a little over. Just yeah. a little over twenty thousand dollars, and that's a heck of a price tag to pay when you're building a house, especially if you're trying to stay in affordable. But that's what it costs to buy into the infrastructure. The uh, state passed a law in, um, in I think is around 1999, somewhere right at the end of the right around 2000, that it's not legal for taxpayers to subsidize new construction. So somewhere along the line, you have to implement the billing and the fees to pay for infrastructure as it goes in or as it's being used. Okay, nothing else? Have a lot of motion. You like making history? I'll make it. Oh, yeah, you bet. I'll jump right out there. Take the scary leap. Motion to adopt resolution 23 R 1236, authorizing the city manager to sign three RUS built bulletins 1780 27, totaling 24 million 996,000 in loans and two million five hundred and sixty nine thousand in grants and authorizing the city manager to incur debt through USDA in the same amount at two percent to finance the wastewater treatment and sewer line improvement project second and the question please Councilor Morowski yes Councilor Schreiber yes Councilor Hodges yes Councilor Martin yes Mayor Henskog yes motion carries Item H, information only, is uh, February vouchers. Can I? Mayor Hedenskog, we didn't uh, approve the consent calendar. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I must have been in a hurry to get to business. <clears throat> item F, we'll back up a little bit. Uh, item F is consent calendar, approved city council meeting minutes for February 27th, 2023. And number two is accept planning commission minutes for February 7th, 2023. I'll make a motion to approve consent calendar. I'll second. Councilor Hodges? Yes. Councilor Morowski? Yes. Councilor Martin? Yes. Councilor Schreiber? Yes. Mayor Hedenskog? Yes. Question. Remarks from the mayor and councilors. Was it the informational? Did you, want, did you have something to say about the non-action items? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Nothing, nothing worth 
the the words. Remarks? Remarks from the council. Uh, one of these days I get through a meeting without remarks. <laughs> um, no, just looking around at the audience, uh, I know that there's a lot of friction going on. I get that. But I want to say, uh, with that in mind, this is what government's about, you know, the voice of the people. And, and I really appreciate the fact that so many people have come out to this meeting and um, you know I, I to me it's a little bit unfortunate when there isn't the friction that the meeting has two people <laughs> um, so uh, you know I get that part and I'm not really gonna speak on that part right now but on the bigger picture uh, this is this is the way it works your voice um, being able to come out and you know be heard so I appreciate every one of you coming out and being heard um, this is what democracy is all about. So on that, uh, thank you. No, oh, I'll second that. <laughs> well said, Isaac. Anything else? Okay. It's 8.06. I motion to adjourn. I second. All in favor. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs>